Thank you very much. Uh, I, th I want to thank the techie guys, otherwise I wouldn't have any video and then we'd be in trouble. I sort of go by this. Uh, this is really this, a story of uh, two schools in Maine which started saving seeds. And so you have to know a little bit of history about what happened. The guy that's on the screen right now is Neil Lash, and we were teaching biology and, and uh, earth science at Madonna Valley High School. And uh, one day, the principal came up to us and said, do you want to run a horticulture program? There's an old greenhouse out back that needs renovation. And we thought, well, geez, we're right into this. And we said, sure. So we took on the project, and we renovated the greenhouse. And we got a head house going, a little classroom. And we started teaching horticulture, which was a lot of fun. And we put out a little garden. And so we had a high school gardening program, like so many gardening programs across the country. And then one day, uh, Neil and I had been showing Victory Garden videos to the kids that we've been taping at home. And one day there was Kent Whaley right in front of this barn with a guy from the Victory Garden talking about Seed Savers Exchange. And it was my class I was teaching. It was a horticulture two, which was the advanced horticulture. And Neil walked in and we both looked at each other and we looked over each other and we just smiled. Said, hey, this is cool. I joined Seed Savers Exchange the very next day. And, uh, and the first seed that we, that we ordered was Big Rainbow. And uh, they don't do it this way anymore, but there was a, it was an older woman that sent me the seeds. By the way, we still have it in our collection for the same, the same seed that we got that day. But she, she'd take the seeds and she'd spread them out on newspaper and just let them dry. And then she'd take scissors and cut out hunks and send them to you. So you had this piece of newspaper with the seeds all dried and crusted on the newspaper, which was really pretty cool. And so this, this is Neil Lash, and he was supposed to be here, here with me because he and I worked together on this project uh, in Madonna Valley High School. But he will not fly. And I, you know, if any of you know Will Bonzo, he won't fly either. So he wanted to take the train, but he said too much of his summer would be taken taking the train. So he wouldn't take the train. Next year, I'm thinking of driving him out because this guy, He'll come up to the first slide on a show, and he'll go into a story, and an hour later, the show will be over. Yeah, because he'll tell a story about Tuscarora, Indian corn, and he'll go on and on and on. He is a historian, and I really want him here with me today, but I can, I can, I can do just fine. So uh, if I can get this to, all right. Uh, so. Neil and I worked together from 1992 until 2006, and we collected 600 varieties that we had in our seed room that I had on the database. 600 varieties of vegetables and flowers. And uh, that's a lot, and it was a pain, because we had a, our garden wasn't that big, so we used the community, and the community would come in and take home 18 tomato plants and plant them for us, and we were hoping that we would get the, the tomatoes back. We usually did, but it, it was really difficult. Uh, but we had, a, we had a whole lot of fun, and the kids had a great time. Uh, but another opportunity opened up for me, and it, that opportunity was t being an agricultural coordinator for a district in Midcoast, Maine, which was much closer to home. And so I became the agricultural coordinator for Troy Howard Middle School. And I also had three outlying schools that had substantial gardens that I was responsible for, and I'm doing that to this day. And it's by far the best job I've ever had in my entire life. I truly love it. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, Big Rainbow, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm assuming everybody would know, Big Rainbow Tomato. Tomato. Yeah, and you slice through it, and it's got the yellow and the red, like a rainbow, and it's really, really nice. Okay, and uh, so I, I started the job there, and, uh, and it sort of blossomed. There was this, this small garden with a big greenhouse. Uh, since then, I've built two hoop houses with the kids. We've doubled the size of the garden. We've made some isolation gardens. And uh, we're just having a great time. And so this, what this is a story of, and I want, what I want everybody to take back with them is that, that local school gardens can do a lot, not only for the kids in, in, in the school, but for the community. And I've noticed that the community has been wonderful, and I've gotten to know everybody in the community because they're coming around all the time. And they, they treat me like an extension agent. I really don't know that much, but I act as though I do, which is great. So anyway. And another cool thing is that the people start taking notice of your project when it starts doing really well. And so I'm going to 
spot back here for a second and go to and so you can see you can see everything that happened in a whole year in just a moment so I hope I can get this to work all right no I don't need Colin I can do this on my own Now, what, what happened is a guy gave us a, a two webcams, free, with a computer and everything. So, he, you know, he's been doing this. This is the third school in Maine he's done this with. So we got it in, you, you can see, April 12th. And so what I, what I do at conferences, I go, well, you can see what was happening in Maine. And you can see how it, oh, there's some rain, and there's a lot of rain in Maine. And, and we can go right through and the whole season here. And you'll see, uh, every once in a while, you see a kid popping up. Because as a webcam, actually, it takes vi not video, but pictures every 20 seconds. So sometimes you catch people, sometimes you don't. Uh, you don't see me working much there. But, <laughs> <laughs> but slowly but surely, things start happening. OK? And we're up to, OK, May 19th. I don't know what's happening in Iowa, but in Maine, not a whole lot. So we are st still keep going here. and. And pretty soon you'll see that I actually tilled a spot here, and we put in the corn, and we put in the cu I'm sorry, we put in the squash. We have a, a large trellis for the squash there that we use, and we always cover everything in Maine because we have horrible cucumber beetles, horrible squash bugs, and more flea beetles than you, you can count. So, uh, <laughs> no, I think we're worse. But so slowly but surely. Things started happening. The corn started growing. There it comes. 42 inches a year. Yeah, oh, sometimes it's foggy for 20 days in a row, I swear. But not, that's not true. But it seems like, like that because I'm complaining the whole time. So the, ki the kids are fascinated by watching what happened the whole year. And by this time, of course, we're into July and that school's out, but I have a summer program, which you'll see in a minute. And, but I had a big gap here from right there. So something happened to the, to the webcam on uh, August 10th and it went all the way to, to September. But then I got to go through the winter here for you. Now there goes the corn. Before long, you'll see the kids have pulled it all out and Sweet corn. Sweet corn. Sweet corn. It, uh, we save seeds, but we only have 70 varieties here. Uh, the, the other f reason I went to this garden, because I love saving seeds, but I don't want it to be the focus of the middle school kids, because we want them to learn about also eating these vegetables. And so if I can grow a garden that I can give most of the produce to the kitchen and to other places, uh, a lot of it goes to the soup kitchen. Uh, we sell to the co-op. And, uh, and we have a, a, a nice farmer market there, too. So we, 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 have, uh, we have some beans. I'll show you in a minute. But, but you're going to see how little snow we had. And this is why we have so many bugs. So all right. This was the, you guys probably didn't have this. We had the uh, Halloween storm, all right? And then it was very nice for a long time. You see, got the garlic planted right in front of you. It's the garlic there, all right? And, and another little storm, but it didn't last. Every time there's a storm, it melted off within a few days. And this is our problem with our bugs this year. We didn't even get ground frozen more than six inches. And usually we go down about four feet. And so we really had a problem. Now that was the longest snow we had, but it greened up every time. So we're, we're right into January here and it's still, the ground's bare. That's, this is not Maine. This year was not Maine. But then we had a storm, and then it's going gonna, it's gonna to go away real quickly here. All right. I have to, every day I have to pull these slides off, by the way, because there's no other way to do it. So I'm always, and they're not the same time of day every day, obviously. 
is I'm doing thing. Now we've got the, the garlic is going to come up in, in uh, March this year, which I don't know if any of you guys had that happen. And usually we have snow on the garlic until the middle of April. So we harvested garlic already, which was two weeks early, right before I came. The kids, uh, in fact, I have some slides of that later. So. Do you always do garlic? Always. No, no. We wrote, we have a we have at least a five year rotation right down the garden. Uh, in in Maine we have a problem with uh, nematode bloat and and so we keep we save our own garlic. We don't get any garlic from the outside. We hold it tight. Don't let anybody uh, send us any garlic or give us any garlic because it's really New York is full of nematode bloat. You ever heard of that? I've heard of this area. No, well, this is nematode bloat, which is really really bad, and. Uh, it's a nematode that gets into it, and it came from New York and Quebec, and it's really bad. All right, so we're going to be up there in a minute here. So there's the garlic looking pretty good, and this is what we had this spring. What's the garden look like there? Nice. See those puddles? Can you see those puddles? All right. It, it rained, and 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 it rained. We, we got, I think, 20 inches of rain. In, uh, in April, May, and early June. So we got half our year's rainfall in a very short period of time. And so I was complaining about the rain, and everybody else was complaining about the drought. So I, now I don't feel so bad because it quit raining there, but now I'm thinking, God, I wish we had a little bit of rain. So, <laughs> so. So getting into uh, the June here, and you start to see the row covers going up and back. That's where the squash is this year. And I ju I'm just going to get to where the kids have harvested the garlic here, which is coming right up. And there you go. It happened on 717. We harvested the garlic, and the 18th it was gone. And the, the 19th I was, I, was, I was home and got the last slide, and the 20th I flew here to Decor, Iowa. So, so I thought that was, I had to show that because I'm really fascinated with our webcam, as you can tell. And, and if somebody goes in the garden when I'm not there, there's a, you can play the day in, real quickly, you can play it back, and, uh, and it runs through the slides real quickly, and I can see who was there and what they were doing and what they may be taking. But uh, there's not a whole lot to take right now anyway, so. Uh, these kids are s from sixth grade to to eighth grade, a middle school. All right, here we go. Troy Howard Middle School Garden Project. This is at my summer group right here, and I, I had that. This was the day we harvested the garlic. I said, "You got to get in front of the sign." They made me that sign as a present at the end of the school year, and in shop class, and I put it up. That's our outdoor kitchen there in front of. We built an outdoor kitchen because. You have to cook which, what's in the garden right there sometimes. It's really nice. And so I'm just going to go through and show you what the garden looks like, what's in full bloom, all right? This is looking from, from the far end. You're looking down, you can see the, one of the hoop houses down there. We have two hoop houses. We were going to do it Elliot Coles, Coleman style, but as it turns out, we haven't moved those hoop houses at all, but we're having a lot of fun with them still, all right? Uh, there's some wheat growing there, which I'll talk about later. And, and you can see the onions. And I got a little bit of row cover on the, uh, on the celery there because there was a woodchuck that was coming in and doing some dirty, so I was trying to keep him away. A lot of flowers. I, I tell the kids, I stress this inside one of the hoop houses. You can see we always grow the uh, eggplants inside the hoop houses because it's so cool in coastal Maine. You've got to understand we're a mile from the coast. So it's really nice and cool. And uh, hot plants that need a lot of heat, we can throw right in these hoop houses. Large sunflower, she's very proud of that. She grew that. Cabbages. and. This is my favorite because I love artichokes. And everybody goes, ah, you can't grow artichokes in Maine, but you can. Uh, you just have to get them real cold. So you throw them in really early. And so they think it's another time than it really is. And, uh, and 
And later on, I'll show you what else we do with the artichokes, which we just did last year, which was our first experiment with artichokes. Corn, squashes on the trellis. I really love the squashes on the trellis because they go up and the squashes hang down. The kids can walk inside the trellis and look at the squashes can hanging down. Well, here it is. You can see it. It's, it's, it's just a, a big A-frame, and it's got uh, cement wire on it. So the cement wire holds the, and it's, 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 uh, so it's a six-inch square, so the young squash can drop through, and they'll just hang there. So it's really nice. Did you have a cover with row cover as well? We had the squash covered with row covers earlier, and then we pulled them off when they got hot, large enough to outrun the beetles. And so then they went up. What beetles are those? Cucumber beetles. They're really bad. If you talk to Rob Johnston, he'll tell you what's it like at Johnny Selected this year. Mm -hmm. They're eating right through the, if you went to the uh, workshop on, uh, on hand pollinating, they're eating right through the outside of the, uh, of the, of the flowers and getting in and ruining the entire hand pollination process. So. And this is why I tell the kids, I said, now, no matter what happens in the, in the garden, if we plant some nice flowers in front, people are going to drive along, and they're going to see the flowers, and they're going to say, wow, what a nice garden that is. <laughs> and so we do that every year. We always have a strip all the way along, all different kind of flowers. I have them start tons of annuals, and, uh, and it's really nice because we, we, uh, sometimes there's some, there's some crop failures. And anybody know what that is? It's a tomato. And what, what variety? Rainbow? No, that's a, ye that's a, yellow, a young yellow stuffer. So. And a uh, young lady with a nice pepper. And we, we grow a lot of gourds, and I'll tell you why later. The, we have a wonderful art teacher. She'll do something with anything that we grow, and she'll come up with wonderful ideas. And uh, so she's going to do something with gourds. These are all dried now. She's going to do something next year. I'm not quite sure what it is. We'll see, we'll see what it is. A lot of onions. We have, uh, this is marine clay soil. It's been amended heavily with a lot of leaves and a lot of manure. And boy, can you grow garlic and onions. Beautiful garlic and onions. And uh, here's the kids getting ready to make salsa. We, uh, we make salsa every year and we sell it, which is a fun thing to do. Potatoes. And that's uh, Dakota Black. That's one of the, our heirlooms. And we, we uh, use uh, timing to to keep that isolated, because that comes in out later than our sweet corn, so. And a lot of row covers. I, I'm sorry, a lot of uh, uh, cover crops. And so this is where the garlic was, and so we put, we put a cover crop, and then when we had the garden tour, because we're always on the Belfast garden tour the, every year, and uh, everybody goes, well, why do you have all that grass growing in the middle of your, and I said, oh, it's a cover crop. So a lot of people learn a lot from this. And Ever seen one of these beehives? Top bar beehives? Well, don't get one. <laughs> we didn't buy it. The woman put it in the garden as an example, and the bees never made it through two winters. So they're, it's after a, uh, a style that's done in Africa. Kids, either the kids took these pictures or the librarian, which she loves to do. So she, all right. We, we always grow a lot of uh, morning glories, blue moon. All right, this is, this is one of the problems we had the last two out of the three years, and it's, it's enough to make me quit gardening. And anybody know what that tomato has? No? Late blight. Has anybody ever seen late blight? Oh, God. It's the worst thing in the world. It, it forms these lesions. Well, this, this whole top of the tomato has a lesion, and it ruins the tomatoes completely. And extension will come by, and we have 110, 120 tomato plants every year. And they order me to pull out all my tomato plants because the spores are going to go somewhere else. And uh, they all got every single oh, when it hits, it, it goes right through. There's no way. There's no way to stop it. Late blight is a is a well. It's the same thing. Phthora infestans is the same thing that caused the Irish potato famine. And it's the exact same organism. So people also had trouble with potatoes. A lot of Maine potato growers got the blight as well. So it's really a nasty thing. And Any preventive measures? Uh, no, it comes from out of state every year. It comes, it comes in on the winds. Or one year they blamed it on big box stores buying tomatoes from 
from down south, and when they came up, they had it, and then it came out. So it was a real problem. You know, one year, once, back in 95, we had an early blight, and uh, we removed all the effective. We got caught it early. Then we used Equifedum or horse tail tea and sprayed all the rest. It nipped it in the bud. Well, this one is a totally different beast. Okay. Yeah. It go, the stems get, the whole plant will die almost within five days. So nobody's ever seen late blight? God, are you lucky? I'm telling you. Didn't you hear about it on the East Coast? Yes. Oh, it was, it was horrible. And it had to do with the wet, rainy, cool weather. And then when it hits, and if the weather stays that way, it just spreads right through. So if it happens again this year, I'm never gardening again. There's no doubt about it. All right, onions. All right, we have a small orchard as well. But the problem is, this is one of the things you deal with at a school. The, the guys who plow snow think they have to come back 40 feet when they plow the snow. So we lost a few trees last year, so we're putting in a few new trees. And I talked to them, and they go, well, where are we going to put the snow? And I said, well, we didn't have any snow. Why would you push it back so far? We go back and forth. I have to, I have to make peace with them, though, because they do a lot of good for me as well, and, you know, cutting the grass and trimming everything. So, all right, now this is a, just a, a counting that one of the kids did of what we sold by the middle of September. We got to back to school in late August. By the middle of September, this is how many uh, pounds of produce that we sold, 698. This is just the cafeteria alone. And this, this is the most important thing, I think, because the kids, when they know that produce is coming in, they will eat the food that's cooked in that cafeteria, because sometimes they won't. <laughs> they may put it on their tray, but they don't eat a whole lot of it. And so they love the salad bar now. And and then the women are doing a, a one, wonderful things with greens and kale and, uh, and uh, Swiss chard. And so it's making a real difference. And it was the, so popular, all the food coming in the cafeteria, that they bought this woman who's our, our, our soup cook, this little machine to make, to grind up all the, I'm not quite sure what it is, but she was pretty proud of it. And, uh, and she makes Thursday soups, and she calls, she calls it the Garden Project soup every Thursday. So I, I'll haul in something from the garden. The kids will, whatever we have, will come in, and she'll make a soup out of whatever it is, and she makes wonderful soups. So, and, and it just raises the kids' awareness, like, well, this soup came from our garden. They will eat it. Even if they don't like it, they'll try it, which I've, I've noticed, which is really nice. And we have a, a uh, garden farm stand that the kids put out three days a week which is a lot of fun. And notice this one is pretty much empty because they, f they s soon realize that why don't we do when the people pull up, we'll just run and get the stuff fresh. So they'll pull the carrots right away, they'll get the char, they'll get the tomatoes, and uh, the only thing we have out is a few onions and garlic. And so it works really well. So they, they take the order, they run into the garden, and they have a great time. Yeah. And, uh, and one of the one of the greatest things that happens is that all the uh, outlying schools that I'm responsible for will come for garden tours. We had uh, three schools. Every single kid from those schools came for garden tours. And here's one of the kids. The, the kid in the yellow shirt actually is a middle schooler, even though he doesn't look like it. He's about four foot eight. But, but here he, he is showing the kids how to plant some plants so they can take it back to their school. And we have chickens. And here's another kid uh, demonstrating something in the garden to some, some uh, elementary school kids, taking them in the garden. This one, this kid was a big tough kid. Here he is holding the elementary school ha kid's hand, taking him through the garden. He didn't like that at all when I showed that on a slideshow one day. <laughs> and this is a whole, the whole school came one day and they got be a buddy, not a bully on their shirt. So I had them plant tomatoes. Notice what we plant tomatoes with. We use a post hole digger. And someone said, well, you know how people uh, lay the tomatoes sideways and put them in the garden in their nice topsoil. We put them straight down in and throw compost in. And I know the soil's colder down there, but we don't want our tomatoes ripening until later in August because I don't want to deal with tomatoes all summer long. I want them when the kids are coming back and we can use them in the cafeteria. So that's just a little method we have for later tomatoes, actually. And some of the other ones we'll lay on their side so we have some early tomatoes that we can use in the summer program. And a lot of teachers come by from schools in Maine wanting to start garden programs. And I always, I never give them tours. The kids always give them tours. And they're so proud to give those tours. And, and it really makes a huge difference in the way they behave in school and everything else. Uh, I, I could do this job until I'm 85 because just seeing these kids 
uh, blossom is, is a wonderful thing. Unless you get late blight. Well, even late blight, forget it. <laughs> I'll, I'll plant something else, tomatoes, whatever. I don't care. They, didn't, they don't get blight. Uh, we put up, here's uh, Steve Tangway, who used to be the, the lead teacher who's since retired, putting up a, uh, one of the hoop houses that we get from a guy in Moultonville, Vermont, which are really nice houses. And here's the kids that are growing, growing spinach inside. And this is what we do. We still do the Elliott Coleman thing for in the winter. We cover the, the greens and the spinach so we can harvest it all winter long. And, uh, and then we check the temperatures. And so we can find out what the temperature is outside, what the temperature is in the greenhouse, and what the temperature is under the row cover. And so they have the, all these fancy gadgets, which I know little about, but I know a lot now because the kids taught me. And, uh, and this is the three temperatures, and this is uh, over, a, I think, a two-day period. Yeah, it's over a two-day period. And under the row cover, and, uh, at, during the day, it was uh, under 25 degrees, and it got up to 70 in the middle of the day, all right? So these, these hoop houses under row cover stay pretty warm, and things actually grow in the winter. Now, you'll get some frost in the ground in the morning, but it won't go any deeper than a half an inch. And, so, and, and it, the uh, spinach just laughs at it which you'll see right here. This is spinach that overwintered right here. And uh, this is a, a group of kids that's gonna go to the co-op and sell the spinach. Artichokes again. All right, what we did this year is we started the artichokes in the garden, we got a few artichokes, and we pulled them all up, and we planted them in the hoop house, early enough so that they take root. And every single artichoke made it through the winter in our hoop house, which doesn't happen in Maine. I mean, because artichokes don't like the cold that much. And uh, so this spring now, the artichokes are going crazy, and we're getting chokes that are this size. And uh, so far, we've picked, I think, 24 artichokes. And so I'm happy because I love artichokes. Uh, the kids don't like them. Uh, I cooked them for them, but I said, that's OK. I'll eat it. So this is our heated greenhouse. And uh, we have high raised beds in there. And so every year, the math teacher comes out and does, does a little bit of math with the kids. They figure out the area of the, of the uh, raised beds, and they do all the calculations needed to put in all the amendments, and then they turn it over, and, and then they plant greens, and Johnny, uh, I mean, sorry, uh, Rob Johnson's not here. We plant, guess what kind of, of uh, Swiss chard? Bright lights, which was developed by, by Rob. And, uh, and people love it, and we sell it to the co-op. All right, we don't, we don't just give it away or anything because we make four thousand dollars a year just selling Swiss chard, and that really helps run the program. I went to the superintendent and actually said, "Hey, I don't want your money anymore. We're going to be on our own." He goes, "You're not going to make it. We're doing just fine. We have sixteen thousand dollars in the kitty, so and so we're doing really well. So I, I'm cheap. I'm Dutch. So I'm doing." And there's the kids harvesting lettuce. But here's the Swiss chard right there. So we cut it, and it's bright lights, and put it in bunches, box it up, and take it to the co-op. Here's the kids at the co-op with some chard and a bunch of bags of spinach and, and, and mixed produce. They love going down to the co-op. Usually, I, I took a whole busload this day, but usually I just take two kids down every time, and they love it. Hey, can we stop on the way back and get a sandwich somewhere? You know, they, they want to be away from school pretty badly. <laughs> All right. And uh, also in the math class, I had a wonderful math teacher who's since left, which is really sad. And he had the kids write a grant to tr try and improve the energy efficiency of the heated greenhouse. Even though we let the heated greenhouse go down to 45 degrees every night, it still uses a lot of oil. It's running oil. So they came up with this idea of putting this, this bubble wrap. Uh, what's it called? I can't remember the stuff. With, lined with foil, but it's really, it's a pretty good insul insulator. And, and on the north side, we're gonna go up higher. We, we're gonna buy some more, but we got this far. And it made a huge difference, not necessarily in the heating bill, but on, this, on the north side bed. The north side bed was much happier because there wasn't that cold air coming in during the night. And so that bed is doing much better. And we started all our own seedlings in the, in the in the uh, in the greenhouse, and we have a light. We have a bunch of light tables in, in one of my offices, so we can start the things under lights. And this is another way we make money. 
I, I buy some seeds of uh, hanging petunias, and the kids start the hanging petunias. And this year, we almost got a, a single petunia from every single seed that we had, which was wonderful. And so you put, anybody ever grown hanging petunias? All right, you just put one plant in the middle of a big pot and let it go. And then uh, on Mother's Day, throw them all out. And they all went in one day because <laughs> we sell them much cheaper than they, than they would at a... And then we also have the kids write letters to seed companies, and they send us all the last year's seeds, big boxes of them, huge boxes of them. You know, ne you could never use all the seeds they send us. And one year they sent us a bunch of geraniums, and so we st we had a big geranium sale. So we, we look for things in there that we can make it get a sale out of and get a, a good deal. And the, so one kid's project was was this geranium project. And then. Uh, we also found out that uh, this can be quite lucrative, growing uh, rosemary. So we have a huge rosemary plant. Take cuttings from that plant, hundreds of cuttings. I think we sold 300 rosemary plants this year. Yes, ma'am. Well, next slide. Take the cuttings from the rosemary. You, it's got to be soft, the soft tips. And so you have to really have a really healthy plant. You, you can't go back to, the, to the, any hardwood at all, because it won't take. And we got about 95% take this year. We just put it in big cell flats and dome it and put it under the lights and leave it for a long time, usually two and a half, three weeks. Nope. Nope. Did you prune the top? Hmm? Did you prune the top of the cutting? No. What, what do you mean by prune the top of the cutting? Well, if you leave the top intact, then it takes away some of the energy, and if you prune the top of it, you get a better germination. Oh, you mean a better set? Yeah, yeah. better yeah, well, no, we didn't. I'll try that. I never thought about that. We, we prune the top later after we transplant it, so it will bush out. And we, I mean, you know, we... Well, we were getting 90, so I didn't think about it, but maybe I'll get 100 now. Yeah, that might be good. But we sold, we sold approximately 400 rosemary plants this year, most of them to the co-op. They went to the, and people just kept taking I wonder if they kept losing them, and they came back to buy more. I couldn't figure it out. There's not that many people that live in Belfast, but, so... <laughs> All right, we have a little pond in the corner. Uh, we have fish traps that we put out in, in the outdoor ponds and the outdoor streams, and we, we drop fish in here, and the kids keep a track of what type of fish we're catching. Uh, I graduated fisheries biology, so I'm fascinated with all the different varieties of minnows that we can get. And we also have a 100-gallon fish tank in the school, and we put them in there, and they do some research on the fish. So, you know, besides just the gardening part, we try and expand. We have chickens. And rabbits, everybody goes, why do you have the rabbits? Well, poop, basically. <laughs> and, and when the little kids come from elementary school, if we don't have the rabbits there, they're very sad because they get to hold the rabbits and pet them and everything else. They're a pain because I have to take care of them on the weekends. So, but. so is that bed in shredded paper? Yes. Wow. Yeah, and then we just throw the shredded paper in the worm bin. Yeah, yeah with the poop. Now, this is a big problem. Has anybody ever tried growing in a, in a heated greenhouse and yeah, yeah, aphids. And so we're totally organic. We can't spray anything. And so what we do is we buy these guys. And that's an aphidious columni. And we get it from a place in New York. And uh, they send us a little jar of them and just spread them. Where First of all, you have to have a plant that has aphids. So I make sure I get a plant in the greenhouse that's going to have aphids. And it's usually a calendula, which I sort of make, you know, I put it in the middle of the greenhouse and they will come. And then I put these on, and before you know it, you're starting f finding the aphids, which are mummified. And that's a mummified aphid. It's dead. The wasp will sting and, send a, and put an egg in that aphid. And there's a live aphid and a mummified aphid. And then see that little hole coming out the side? Then it will, the wasp will go out, and it has the ability to infect another 100 aphids in the greenhouse. So you can see how this works. Before you got, know it, it, in the right light, on a nice warm day, you can look up and see swarms of these wasps. They're so tiny. They're, sm they're, they're smaller than, uh, than um, fruit flies. So wow. they're really, really tiny. Wow. All right. And we do the same thing with white flies, but that's in Carcia uh, formosa. But it doesn't work as well with white flies. But since I, I keep all the uh, tomato plants out of the, out of the greenhouse, we don't have that much problem with white flies anywhere anymore. Tomatoes are horrible in a greenhouse. And when we go down to 45 at night, we don't have to worry much about tomatoes anyway. All right. 
This is, a, this is a project of an artist that came by and she said, you should build yourself a, a, a loom, a, what she called an earth loom. So you take stuff from the garden and weave it. And the kids have a blast with this because every year they do, uh, they rewarp it and they put in whatever's in the garden in the spring and the fall. And uh, this was a project right here of a artist at the University of Maine. See how people start coming in when you have a project? They say, hey, I, you guys, you can do this for me. And she made these molds to put gourds into. And I said, it's not going to work. Well, it did work. This is a fish mold right here. And, uh, and then she made some weird designs, and she put them up. She got a $12,000 grant for this. And she, and she made some weird designs, and she put them up on the, uh, on the greenhouse. And, I mean, on their uh, outdoor kitchen. It's still there. We also had the froggy molds, which didn't work very well because the head never formed. But, <laughs> but she, she made, I don't understand it either. So, but she, she made the design of the fish and the frog, and then she used this very hard material to make the mold. And so you put it on there and you wire it on, and that, and that gourd, when it's small, will grow into that space. That's the theory. And uh, it worked in uh, these two cases. Yep. Uh, we, we do sell a lot of our seeds. So what the kids do is they make block cuts of the, uh, this is with the art teacher, of uh, the seed packets. So this is like, this is our heirloom, some of our heirloom tomatoes would come looking like this, heirloom with a, with a dash in the middle there. All right. And, uh-oh, this doesn't want to move. It will. I don't want to call a techie guy in again. <laughs> anyway, oh, there we go. And so I have hundreds of these because over the years I, I build them up and I sort of, and here's a whole, this is uh, a bunch of uh, seeds that we're going to sell that the kids have been working on. They, they, uh, what we do is we, we, uh, we scan these things and then we put them on the computer so you can print them out and uh, just slap them right on the seed packets so it's really cool. And she also, she also comes up with designs for, she called these garden monsters or something like that. This is the art teacher who's so, so wacky, she's great. And uh, she helps me with, uh, see these, this is uh, at the co-op every year for the whole month of May, we're, we're able to put up a, some kind of art exhibit, all right, that the kids of, of, the, of the program do. And these are old Seed Savers Exchange calendars which the art teacher cut up into little squares and then she made the kids expand on the squares and then put them back together. They don't all fit together as you can see, but it was really quite interesting. It was, it was a neat idea. And this year she did something even better and that's, that's why I wish that, um, the, uh, what's his name that was here this morning speaking? Uh, Mr. Uh, yeah, Ken, because he had some of these pictures as well. What they did is they projected, they went on the internet, found these antique seed packages, they projected them and then they sketched them out with pencil and then they painted them in. And they were this big. And we put them all across the co-op, all around the co-op. People wanted to pay $100 for some of them. And, but the kids took them all home. They wanted them. They weren't even gonna sell them for $100. I would have sold them for $100. All right. And just beautiful. This is, Ken had this one this morning. I saw that up on the, on the screen. That was my favorite. I really wanted that one. I do have some uh, better, uh, pictures than these even, then I may make some posters. This was really a cool one right here. And Petunia. Kid from the Philippines did this one. He just moved it in from the Philippines. We have a lot of Filipinos in Midcoast, Maine. And uh, he was quite an artist. Really nice job. The peas. And every once in a while, the, the math teacher will make them do designs. And this year, they did designs of, uh, of the heated greenhouse. All right, this is the Common Ground Fair. Anybody familiar with the Common Ground Fair in, in Maine? Well, that's too bad. What? The Union Fair. Oh, the Union Fair. Yeah, it's close. <laughs> Union Fair is right down the road. Uh, these, we, take the, we take the whole crew, which is 95 kids every year to the Common Ground Fair. It's quite, enough, it's quite uh, wild because we have to keep track of them. These kids thought they were drinking. They had their root beer, but they thought it looked like beer, so they were, wanted them to show, show me. And... Uh, Go organic, locally grown. They have a great time. This, and then we always, we always put stuff in the uh, exhibition hall. And Amy LeBlanc is the person that runs that. And anybody met Amy here this week? Well, she's here this week, and she runs the exhibition hall. 
And so we sometimes put up to 100 varieties of our vegetables there. And this is a, a pumpkin that the kids had scratched their, their name in, which was disqualified because of that. But they gave us some kind of ribbon anyway. <laughs> All right. But they loved it. And there's our Dakota Black that, that's in the exhibition hall and our beautiful onions. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and, the, and the sunflower heads. And here's a local volunteer helping the kids get the, uh, the annual flower designs ready for the, for the fair. And they won a blue ribbon for that. It's at the fair. And they, they took some dried status, and they made a beautiful wreath. They, they just have a blast doing this kind of thing. Because uh, I don't know if you know how deadly middle school can be. I mean, it can be horrible. And, and, and they just say, this is so great. And then I give this talk to, uh, to adults, uh, you know, in their 20s and 30s who are teachers, and they go, why couldn't we have that when we were in middle school? And, and I said, yeah, I wish I had it too. And here's the kids displaying some of the ribbons they won. And one year we won 50 blue ribbons, and we get $3 for each blue ribbon, and we could exchange that for seeds from either Fatco or Johnny Selected. And uh, so we do that every year. And one year we got over $200 worth of seeds for just displaying at the, in the, uh, at the fair. And uh, we haven't done this in a couple of years, but we used to have, instead of a science fair, we'd have a garden fair. And the kids would all research something that had to do with gardening and uh, make a display out by the garden. And that was a lot of fun. This is our summer program. This is last year. Uh, it's called Get Growing, and it's, it's like a summer camp. They come two days a week, and they work for an hour and a half in the morning first. And you might think, well, only an hour and a half, but boy, it's a struggle sometimes to get those kids to work for an hour and a half. And, but some of them do a really good job. And then we get, gather all the food from the garden that happens to be there, and we cook something in our outdoor kitchen for an hour and a half. And, uh, and this year, I had up to 16 kids, and they really had a blast. Here's, this is this year, year's group. And uh, what I have them doing first is mulch the entire garden with leaves. So that, there they are displaying their leaf mulch. This is, before we had the outdoor kitchen, we would, the, out, the uh, summer program would cook in, uh, in the old uh, kitchen in the school. Here's the group. So we let the kids do the cooking. And sometimes okay, sometimes not too bad. Uh, we made uh, garlic pesto this year, which was wonderful out of the scapes. And, this is a woman who just came back from the Peace Corps in Africa, and she volunteered. We have a lot of volunteer cooks come in. She made some wonderful African food. And this is uh, three days ago, or four days ago, I can't remember, our, our garlic harvest. And there they are harvesting garlic. And you're probably wondering why I still have row cover on there, because those are cucumbers. And the cucumbers, we want to mature about September 1st, because then, once again, they'll go right into the kitchen. There's the garlic harvest. And here's the janitor speaking roughly to me about me using the chair case to dry the garlic. <laughs> that is where you put the chairs up. <laughs> and he, he had a function coming up, and he needed it. I said, you can't have it. <laughs> and this is, uh, I, can't, I don't know when this was, but this is the garlic up when it should have been covered with snow. It should have been covered with snow. So, And uh, briefly, we put the garlic out in the sun to dry because Maine doesn't have hot sun like you do. If it gets up to uh, 85, we're lucky uh, on the coast. This is a big rainbow tomato, by the way. All right. So, uh, by the way, this is the beginning of the seed saving portion of the show. I forgot to say that. We have uh, five varieties of garlic. We have uh, one which I really love. Anybody ever grown Phillips? You probably have Phillips at the farm, I bet you. Maybe not. If not, I'll get it to you. Phillips is, it, it was found in Phillips, Maine. That's why we grow it. It's a, it's a Maine, it, it, it didn't come from Maine, obviously, but it ended up there somehow. And then Red Russian, and German Extra Hardy, and Broadleaf Czech, and uh, Georgian Fire. Those are the varieties we grow. And then at home, I've got about 12 varieties. And then sometimes we rotate those varieties from home into the school as well. We grow 1,000 head a year. And the project that we did last year was that Extension bought them, and they, they would give them out to local schools with a kit that told them how to make a 4 by 8 bed of garlic. And so I think uh, 35 schools got our garlic, and then they planted out their own 4 by 8 bed 
And uh, I hope they put a lot of nutrition in there because I can imagine them having garlic the size of my thumb and then saying, why did I grow garlic? But uh, garlic does like to be fed heavily, as you guys probably know. Anyway, so we have about maybe 40 varieties of tomatoes. That, these are the tomatoes that I brought from Madamic Valley that I really liked, and then we've been adding slowly. I didn't want to go too crazy. I'm gonna, I, I, I said I didn't want to be beholden to the seed saving part of it because I've got so, much, so many other things to do. And I'm working with middle schoolers, and it's a little bit hard to make sure that everything stays pure, if you know what I mean. 12-year-olds uh, don't do a real good job with uh, squeezing tomatoes into the right spot. And uh, so here we're doing taste tests with the heirlooms, all right? We have a couple green tomatoes here, and uh, I think a, a black prince and a garden peach and a pink grapefruit, and pink grapefruit being one of my absolute favorite tomatoes. And uh, the kids ate, ate them right up. Even kids that never ate tomatoes before were willing to try it. And here, here's the kids saving tomato seeds. I use clear uh, jars so they can watch the fermentation process go on. And you can see the seeds start to drop to the bottom, and you see what's going on. And uh, this is a little project we've, we're going, we're trying to dehybridize what else? Sun gold tomatoes. <laughs> so I heard this morning that everybody's trying to do this, but uh, just, just to give the kids a little bit of uh, I interest in genetics. And I think we're on the F4 generation this year. And we're not doing it the way it should be done. We don't have enough plants out. I just don't have the room, but we're going through the process. And so every year they keep choosing the one that's most like sun gold, and they use a, a rating sheet like this, and they go out and they eat them and they rate them. And, Last year was a little bit tough because 90% of them had uh, the blight, and uh, they looked horrible, to tell you the truth. But you can save tomato seeds even after the blight, they claim. So, and here's the kids putting in uh, the pole beans, heirloom pole beans. What we use is we use tomato cages, and we put the pole beans around the outside, and they grow up in the tomato cages, which is real nice. And you can actually pull the whole tomato cage out, and they can go over, and they can shuck all the beans out. and. Uh, this is the coolest thing because they want to get out of class. Mr. Thurston, can I get out of class to just to shuck the beans? Because they just want to sit there and shuck the beans and look at the different colors. They really like it. So here they are coming up, even though they're uh, underwater at this point. You can see the rain. And these are the uh, bush beans. And there's the bean collection right there. And then they, they did their own cuts for the heirlooms as well. And this is like a Norgewalk uh, dry pole bean. And, uh, I like this one because it's got the two beans dancing. It's very nice. And this is Hutterite soup bean, rattlesnake heirloom beans. So we have a lot of different ones to choose from, so we don't have to use the same block cut every time. Boothby's blonde cucumber. And then we take them down to the co-op, and we put them in a little container. We sell them for a buck a piece. It's pretty cheap. They all go. And uh, here's... Uh, Joe Littlefield with uh, the heirloom tomatoes ready to be planted into the greenhouse. We take a four pack, and each section of the four pack gets a few tomatoes, and we write on the outside, real simple. And then we can pop that out and then prick it out and put it in and start growing our, our tomatoes. And here's the tomato sale in the middle of a rainstorm, <laughs> once again. And uh, we sold about 500 seedlings this year of heirloom tomatoes. And, uh, People go crazy. They, we sell them for a dollar a piece. Somebody said that's way too cheap. But it's fun to see somebody come with a, their own flat and take 18 tomato varieties and take them home. And Because uh, you know they'll be back next year. Then I'll sell them for two. <laughs> and here's our, what our fabulous math teacher who went on to become a principal. What a waste that was. Uh, I gave him a real hard time about it because he's a good friend of mine. But he did everything in the garden with these kids calculating everything he could, do, doing any kind of math he could in the garden. And a lot of it was algebra, and it's really nice stuff that he did. Luckily, he left it all with us, and we have it in a notebook for the next teacher. Uh, and every year, what he did is he also mapped the garden out so we could do our rotation. So we have garden maps every year. And uh, we haven't done this in a few years, but we used to grow wheat in the garden, and then we grind it. And then we make pizzas. But to tell you the truth, we put maybe just a touch of this, of our own weed in with the 
I mean, our own flour in with the other flour because I tried making a pizza out of just our flour. It's like eating a rock. <laughs> I tell you, it was, it was bad. But, <laughs> but it was fun. And growing the wheat is just a, is, is a trip. I, I, I followed Will Bonzo's method where he put it in nice rows and he takes the, he takes the, he mulches it with leaf mulch in between so it came up nice and pure and it was, uh, and it's really pretty in the garden. And there's the pizzas that they made. Each group of kids made their own pizza. Most of the ingredients came from the garden because we had all the peppers growing in the, in tomatoes and everything. And this is one of our outlying gardens at the elementary school and uh, drink water school garden. And this is probably the best one. They come over every year and they spend a whole day starting their seedlings at our school. And then they take them back and put, put them on the lights and then they plant their garden. And, uh, and they have a real good time. And they, have a, they use a lot of the stuff in the cafeteria as well. It's a nice big garden. And uh, the cool thing about where I work is that there's 80 acres of land. So on this 80 acres, we have a stream, we have a pond, we have a lot of woods. You can do a lot of things. So just besides the garden project, I take these kids on hikes all the time. We put out uh, fish traps everywhere on the stream, trying to see what's in there. Uh, here's, the, here's the kids on a, on a hike here, uh, more like on a run, I think this kid is. Uh, we tap the trees in the, in the uh, late winter. And make, we made a lot of syrup this year, which we make pancakes. Uh, there's a group of uh, sp the special needs kids who love to come out there and work. I always give them a section of the greenhouse to work in, and they grow all kinds of stuff. I let whatever they want to grow, we grow. So, and here's how we get some of our nutrition. This is the cafeteria. This is the toughest part of the job: is getting the kids to put their garbage in the right spot. And so we have this. A container, but they'll just dump it all into the trash can. So what we made, the art teacher, once again, crazy art teacher, made a picture of, that's me, which is a little tiny mouth about like that. So they had to put their trash through there. And they couldn't dump their tray through there. But by the end of the th third week, there's a lot of junk on top of my face. <laughs> so, but it, it did work. And so somebody actually using it that didn't want to be identified, all right? And so what we do is we, we layer that, that, uh, that compost from the cafeteria with the leaves that we get from the city. Here's a pile of leaves from the city. Still steaming. Teachers, boy, did they complain about this because they've been sitting there for three years at the, at the bus garage at the, at the, in the city, and when they got it, it was all anaerobic, so it had that smell like a, you know, septic. And I said, that's okay, it's just anaerobic, you know. Didn't you, don't you remember your high school biology? It's going to be okay. And uh, the smell did go away. Here's the kids on top of a pile we got this year. We had 12 10, uh, tw 12, 12 yard dump trucks come, and we're going to use it all. So, and not just for compost, but we mulch everything with it too. Here's the compost bins. The local hardware store just gives me their pallets. We just keep adding pallets as we go. The kids will dump the garbage in. They'll take a wheelbarrow of leaves and layer it. The teachers are in on it now because a lot of them can't. Uh, can't save their compost at home for anything, so they take it, they take it in, in, and haul it into the uh, school, which is real nice. And uh, this is one of the kids' projects one year. We have these great uh, uh, probes that you can put anywhere, and, and it will record the temperature. You plug it in the computer, and it does instant graphs. This is easy to do. And so the kid took one of those compost piles and turned it vigorously, added a few uh, uh, green things, give it a little bit more nitrogen and he got it up to about 150 degrees and then he actually recorded the cooling process as well over a period of days and uh, that was a nice project uh, this in the hoop house we dug a hole and we, that's where our worm bin is here's the kids opening the worm bin and we dump all kinds of garbage in the worm bin as well here's the kids pretending to eat the worms okay uh, then we in the spring I'm sorry in the fall we empty that entire worm bin and then we we sift it through the uh, hardware cloth here, pulling out the, as many worms as we can, then we start it all over again. So I don't have to try and separate it out, we just do it all at once. So all summer long, those worms are working, they're working as we speak. And that's what we get, we get two full uh, 35 gallon trash cans of pure uh, worm castings, which is used in our soil mix. A little bit, and every time we use our soil mix, we throw some of that in. And then, 
uh, the big project has been the outdoor kitchen. And this is the first part of it. We got a grant for this, and this is as far as we got. And then, uh, luckily, the uh, local hardware store has their kids go to the school, and the, the local mill, their kids go to the school, and they start giving us wood. And before you knew it, the kids were working on this thing. And, and then I got, a, I got a new social studies teacher who was a, a solar buff, and he developed this method to create a the kids are building it right now. It's a, a hot air heater, and there it is. Ever seen one of these? They burn the hole in the bottom of the cans, and they stack the cans. The air comes in, goes through the cans, the black cans, and comes out the top. And it really does heat the, that little kitchen area. Here's the kids when we just put them up. And here's a, a graph of the temperatures. Temperature of the air going into the bottom of one of these heaters and coming in the, out of the top of one of these heaters. So they're, the science teacher is making use of this, which is real nice. And here's in uh, outdoors and inside the kitchen after the heaters were finished. And then Rotary got involved because my daughter went on exchange in Rotary. So they, they said, oh, yeah, you've got a project over there. We want to spend some money on you. And I said, fine, I don't care. <laughs> and so they, they, gave, they either gave us material or gave us money. This is PEX tubing. And so I one day with 10 seventh graders, I poured this cement floor with them, which was quite a chore, but we did it. And it came out okay, and here they are. Spread. They loved it, you know. They can get in there with the boots on. And, and uh, here's the kitchen almost finished, and there's the final product. Now, off to, the, to your left, you'll see those, those three solar panels there. That's the, that's the project. That's going to heat the uh, glycol or whatever we're going to use that's going to run into the, into the base of the solar kitchen. And it's going to be somehow done. We haven't finished it yet, so I'm not exactly sure how it's going to happen, but the solar guy claims it's going to happen. So, and th th in, in 2008, we built this uh, clay oven too, which is right outside. And so the kids can walk out and fire this oven up and bake bread and bake pizzas. And uh, it's really a neat thing. Anybody ever use a clay oven? Yeah, yeah they're, they're wonderful. You crank them up, and you can cook all day with them after they're cranked up. And various, you can start with pizzas real hot, and then before you know it, you can, you can bake bread and throw chicken in. We've cooked the chicken in here before. And then <coughs> we have, uh, we used to have MBNA, which was a credit card company. Now we have Bank of America that's in Belfast. And they send volunteers over all the time because they can work in the garden and get paid for it. Because, you know, and they'd rather be outside than in at the computer. So uh, here's, a, here's a crew of two. I've had crews up to 15 before. They're wonderful workers. Uh, they have a great time. And, uh, and any time I get behind, I will call my friend over at Bank of America, and she'll send some workers over. And uh, they're required to do this anyway. So, And we have a lot of older volunteers. that They may or may not be uh, master gardeners. They come and work in the garden all the time. And uh, we're almost finished here. What time we got? Oh, OK. And well, I'm almost done anyway. So and then we had, we, we built a raised bed demonstration garden at the end of the uh, garden. I, I expanded the garden as far as I possibly could. And I said, well, we'll put in raised beds. And uh, boy, I liked raised beds. And they're really nice. They dry out too quickly, but they really do a good job. So we did a little project. I wanted to show the kids the value of row covers. So we took one raised bed, planted mixed greens and lettuce. And here it, we took the row cover off, and it looks really nice, beautiful. And the one that we didn't, you can see the thumbs down. It was horrible. Of course, it, it, it rained so hard during this time. I think the row cover, besides giving it some heat and protection from the bugs, it also didn't get pounded by the rain. So, and we're back to Neil, and that's it. Any questions?